City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. Thursday night, you're here at the communications room with Lieutenant Andrew Baxter and myself. <laughs> uh, Drew has a 29-year retired former dispatcher police officer. I'm an active dispatcher in the field for about eight years now. Uh, tonight, we're going to be having a special guest with us, and uh, I'm excited for that. We uh, also have some voicemails pending. But Drew, in the meantime, how have you been doing this past week? Uh, I, uh, first of all, if there's an echo uh, please somebody give me a thumbs up in the, uh, <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, listen, today was, we're in an ever changing world and we're in a, an ever changing, uh, podcast environment. And, uh, we just need to, uh, understand that we're growing and it's good news, uh, that we have these growing pains, but, uh, I tried to upgrade the internet in my home today that didn't work out until probably about an hour ago. So there might be some glitches uh, here and there and we overcome them because that's what we do in the comp center. And that's what our guest is going to talk about too, overcoming. But first we're going to talk a little bit about three LAPD officers who are in stable condition following a shooting in East Los Angeles. The suspect is dead. Three police officers were hospitalized in stable condition Wednesday evening after they were shot by a suspect during an investigation in Lincoln Heights. The suspect was found dead several hours later. Uh, it took place, uh, the shooting took place sometime after 6 p.m. Uh, video from uh, a, a, a news chopper showed a large perimeter that was set up around the scene for what appeared to be a barricaded subject. Police said that the officers had been in the area as part of a felony investigation of a parolee at large. Uh, California seems to have that issue uh, with uh, letting people out of uh, jail and them, uh, of course, shooting at police officers and sometimes killing them. So thank goodness, uh, uh, again, I don't root for death, but in the, but thank goodness in this case, the three officers are in stable condition. Everything is going to be fine there, hopefully. And um, the suspect is, is no longer with us on this planet. Uh, April Schaefer 2.0 for Jonathan's beard has given us another super chat. Very generous. And by the way, uh, we will stick to our uh, normal format that if you like Jonathan's beard, I want you to signify by putting a one in the chat. And if you dislike Jonathan's beard, please, by all means, leave a one in the chat. Uh, go ahead and talk about our guest, bring her on, and then we'll get into some of the fun and voicemails that we have. Then we'll talk about her story. Sure. We can even we can even bring her on to listen to the voicemails. First of all, Hydroman Blue, thank you, 1999. I appreciate that, Hydroman, and I've missed your phone calls. April Schaefer, that's extremely generous. I don't know if that means that I need to invest $50 to salvage the beard or if you just appreciate it that much. Murph 530, $20. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna welcome into the stream uh, my good friend Amanda. We met a few years ago out at training, hostage negotiations training. She is a active 911 dispatcher and dispatch supervisor for Burt County Sheriff's Office in Nebraska. And I know what you're thinking, that not a whole lot can possibly go wrong in Nebraska. Well, you'd be surprised. Uh, anything that can happen anywhere else certainly does happen in Nebraska and perhaps a whole lot more. And we're going to hear about that from Amanda. And uh, Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming. It's uh, very kind. I'm ex very excited to have you on here. Uh, as far as all the dispatchers I've ever met, you are sincerely one of my favorite people, and your story is an amazing one, and I'm so glad you're willing to share it. Uh, so welcome, and why don't we hit those voicemails, Drew? We shall. Uh, you just uh, interviewed, or you just introduced Amanda and then allowed her to nod and moved back to me. So that's great. Uh, this is a, an audio show, and that's uh, the way it, it's going to be, apparently. So just, uh, Amanda, if you have something to uh, contribute, please write it on a notepad and show it to the camera. Um, we, we're going to um, go through a couple of voicemails. I actually have uh, some very fun and exciting uh, like video movie work that, that's a great 
representation of what happens in a communication center. So uh, without further ado, we're going to get into those. Hey, Drew and Jonathan, Com Center, what's up, guys? First off, guns up, giddy up, and a happy whatever day it is to you, Friday to you guys. So I missed your show the other day, or tonight, and uh, I'm just kind of catching up on some old episodes, and Jonathan was talking about an episode 264 about the uh, active shooters and multiple callers, and you get, you know, little bits of information from everybody. A uh, call from my agency uh, that I dispatched for a couple years ago. Same kind of situation, uh, came in as a shots fired call, and it was, you know, one caller, two caller, three callers, and each one of them kind of helped us narrow down where it was coming from until the actual uh, shooter called us and said it was him. So uh, always a fluid situation and stuff like that. I uh, thought, so you know, it's tough to kind of filter through and get the all of the right information to the right people. Anywho, hope you all are doing good. Like I said, guns up, giddy up from... Uh, sunny but cold as hell northern california take it easy guys howdy that's a great point i mean uh, you're going to get the information from a, a million different people it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get quality information from a million different people correct john yeah amanda you do you have thoughts on that i, I would love for you to be a part of the show <laughs> yeah i uh it made me think about when i was uh training at my first agency we had a like a simulated active shooter training that all of our um, officers and deputies went on. And of course, as goes with training, they didn't invite dispatch to participate. Um, <laughs> so we invited ourselves, um, which was pretty cool, and uh, ended up coordinating that the actors on scene would call in. And I was really new and no one told me how to handle it. So um, I ended up sitting there taking all these calls back to back and trying to figure out if there was any good information. And then got yelled at afterwards because I didn't log every single caller's name and phone number. Um, so, you know, learning to prioritize in those situations is so crazy in dispatch and filtering through that information. But he's got a great point there with just trying to figure out what's valuable and what's not in a moving situation like that. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do. That that the uh, the the nine one one. First of all, you struck a nerve with me because I've always said that we don't train dispatchers in. Uh, active shooter we we tell them hey we're gonna go do some stupid active shooter training i want you to monitor the channel we're on mm -hmm. for what uh you know for you're not learning anything and and it's probably for a safety issue which is again it just it goes to the greater problem that we always talk about it's just kind of like just listen to what we're doing just just sit there in the corner um which is obviously not the proper way to treat human beings one but uh the the people that are your lifeline is probably uh, it's probably beneficial to include them in the training. So I'm glad uh, you recognize that. And hopefully you'll take the initiative because I understand that you're a newly promoted supervisor. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably the biggest mistake our agency's made um, so far, but uh, <laughs> no. we're working through it. <laughs> um, yeah. So taking that experience and hoping that we can get good quality training for our guys and gals here is really important. So well, hopefully we're moving in that direction. Amanda's All definitely right. being modest. Yeah, of course she's being modest. I mean, that's what dispatchers do. Um, Hydra Man Blue has pointed out that Lady Liberty looks good in my background uh, and is wondering if it's always been there. And the answer to that is yes. Lady Liberty has always been there, but she stands mighty tonight for some reason. The scales of justice will never be tipped because Amanda is here to keep us safe. Let's go to the next phone call. Gents, it's your neighborhood lumber chef. Big time fan, first time caller. And I must say, I very much enjoy your uh, automated message machine, especially knowing that you guys are offline right now in the middle of a Tuesday afternoon. And I just wanted to shed some more light on the leadership that Micah had, um, being the, uh, I believe, started, if I'm not mistaken. Regardless, I think this just, this would just apply to everybody. I'm not in a traditional leadership role. However, how you carry yourself, you'll always be in your leadership role. People will always look up to you, especially in a work environment with how, we, how you conduct yourself, how you go about doing your work and always doing the right thing, especially when nobody's looking because that's what really matters. If you have a good work ethic, that's a good start. Get that job done. People will notice over time and people, good people will want to emulate that. So as long as you lead by example, and especially when you get into a leadership role um, where you have like some type of managerial position or you're, uh, you're a sergeant, lieutenant, you, you get yourself up the ranks, 
shit, even the, even the military teaches all of this, right? Your actions do speak, speak volume more than your words. So even if you have that title, keep doing the normal stuff on top of your other duties. You're given that, that position or you're in that position, which means that you're going to have more work to do. That's- hey, guys. A little honesty goes a long way. And uh, Amanda, I'm curious, um, you being newly promoted, and I'm only stating something obvious. I'm not judging you by your looks, but you seem kind of younger from a younger generation. Do you have um, any kind of like pushback from the people that you work with or are they generally in your generation? You know, um, our department is kind of interesting. We have um, kind of two ge- very specific generations. Our, our admin is all um, an older generation. And then um, like our road patrol and our dispatch is actually fairly young, which is really neat. Um, so we get a lot of just the new perspective and people that are willing to set their ego aside and work together and not, you know, be trying to flex experience on each other and all of that. So um, we we're all around the same age, which is really, really a unique um, setup for a department. And I think we've got just a good mix, honestly. So that's great. Uh, um, John, are you young or old? I'm, I'm <laughs> just every day I'm driving over a cliff. Uh, this call was in reference to Micah, one of our listeners, who's a uh, sergeant out in the Southwest. Uh, he has been a sergeant, I believe, for about a year, and he had just had some questions about leadership. I think I already covered it pretty well, but uh, the ethics part that Lumber Chef is covering is just so critical. Sometimes you think that the stuff that you don't do at work doesn't matter at work, but it, it absolutely does. And people are always watching you. And um, in public service and elsewhere, I guess I can only really talk about public service. But truth is, when you're a boss, people talk about you. And you leave a room, you're still the subject of discussion, whether you like it or not. And just make sure that the stuff that they have to say about you, and if it's based on the truth, just make sure it's all good things. And that is largely within your control. I'm I'm not going to pick the low hanging fruit, but I am going to pick the low hanging fruit of Laverne, Tennessee. I mean, uh, there were a couple supervisors that were involved in that whole scandal. And I, I, I mean, do you think they would recover? E- even if they went back as supervisors, do you think they would be trusted by everybody? And I, I mean, I get the, the small department feel sometimes, uh, no pun intended, but um, I, I think you, your conduct on duty and off duty says a lot about you when you're on duty, whether you whether you like it or not. And that's just part of the uh, just kind of comes. It, it's not written in the contract, but it's something you signed uh, when you decided to become a supervisor or not you specifically, Amanda, but anybody, you know, if you're in a leadership role like that, it, for people to look up to you, you have to do things for them to look up to. So. Uh, we have two more calls here. It's uh, not ten seven canoe. Ooh, he, that's that's gonna throw me off because he's saying it's not ten seven canoe. The ten six guy is definitely a uh, a newfie, <laughs> just by the way that he sounds. So can confirm. And uh, if he's not a newfie, then I'm super weirded out. <laughs> My opinion: the higher the priority, or the worse the call sounds. Uh, when it's dispatched, uh, the more serious uh, for me as a street cop is good. I'd rather go to a call prepared and in the mindset uh, that if I'm going, if like if I'm going into a scenario where I need to fight someone or uh, I, I might fight someone, might use force, something like that. I'd rather be mentally prepared uh, and maybe even physically prepared, uh, and then get there just to find out that everyone's calm. So that's just my experience and my opinion for a street cop for six years. So, uh, yeah, love the show. Uh, guns up, giddy up. Well, we love you. Yeah. Cobb Center is the number one law enforcement related podcast in Canada. Apparently all of our fans are, are up there. We've got 10, six, 10, seven canoe, not 10, seven canoe, possibly some other guys. So he's calling out 10, six as being a newfie or someone from Newfoundland, which as we all know, is basically the Alabama of, Canada. So uh not really a compliment to say that someone's a newfie. Uh right. Amanda, you also heard him say we, a few weeks ago we were discussing uh a call in Michigan where we had a domestic and the call taker coded it as a, a mental ho- mental health type call, a priority two call, and left it holding for several hours and the shift changed and uh that, that call ended up escalating into a brutal homicide of a man uh, by a hammer by his son. 
And so we have been talking lately about the importance of proper call typing, but whenever discretion is involved, you know, typing the call type as higher priority than maybe, you know, kind of over typing it to make sure that officers know that there's a, a, a a known unknown or dangerous situation there what do you think about call typing in terms of using the information that you have from the call and deciding what kind of priority it should be you know it's an interesting topic because i've worked with um dispatchers who err on both sides of that spectrum um and i i can see the pros and cons because just having worked with some that like to over dramatize some calls, you know, um, that can also be really damaging to your responders. If, you know, you're blowing things up into something that isn't there and putting them at risk, you know, driving at high speeds and all those things that put our responders in danger. Um, so it's something to, to figure out a balance on, but you know, if there is any doubt, if you tell me that there's firearms in the home, but I'm sure they're secure, that this person can't get to them. We don't know that, you know, so always providing all of that information when in doubt, I think, it's better to err on the side of making sure they are fully prepared for where that situation could go than not. I think uh, the concept of priming, uh, specifically dispatch priming, is probably going to be at the forefront in the next couple of years because we still search for the reason for uh, excessive force, whether you know uh, <laughs> whether it exists or not is a different story. But I mean, um, I, I do think at some point you know, we're going to have to delve into the conversation of uh, if you're if you're erring on the side of caution to say, yes, there are weapons in the house because you know that there this is the old example that you know that there's a, a set of knives in the in the kitchen drawer. Um, you're not, you're somewhat priming that officer for some kind of confrontation, maybe with a fight. Um, it's not you know, it, it is scientific, but it's not uh, cut and fat, uh, cut and dry. But um, I don't know. I think it's just something to think about. There are definitely two sides to that story. I, I liked your take, Amanda, that sometimes like if you are constantly over dramatizing things that uh, that's where complacency sets in, because we've all got those people in our communities where there's trouble there routinely, or we know to expect a call from that house or that person or that couple. And uh, it can become very routine to us. and if we constantly all, are always putting it out like it's like the worst possible thing going on, you know, it might cause some complacency by officers responding. Well, we, you know, I've run into this as with officers who, you know, you they, they get on that radio and they just start screaming. And really all they're doing is just a simple traffic stop. I mean, so you, you just think, oh my gosh, the universe must be crashing. You know, like there's an asteroid on its way. Uh, but no, they're just stopping a red Vega. Um, like. It ha it, it definitely goes both ways. So, um, you know, I, I think listening for the tone and temperament and understanding the source um, is a very important part of everyone's job on both sides of the radio. But it's also um, there's also that boy who cried wolf factor that like, you know, you're right. You do come, become complacent. You're just like, oh, that's that's Barney again, uh, screaming on the radio for no reason. And what if he's screaming on the radio because there's a reason um, that becomes an issue, obviously. So, uh, the, you know, we we talk about a little bit Uvalde. That was one of the issues. They had bailout alarms. They lived uh, the, Uvalde's close to the border, so uh, the 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 cops would often chase people that ran through checkpoints, and they would get to Uvalde, and all the Uvalde schools would have these bailout alarms. And the problem is, there's no difference between a bailout alarm and an active shooter alarm. So if they're averaging two or three bailout alarms a week, after a while, it just becomes wallpaper. And you're just like, all right. So, I mean, there's another guy that skipped the border in a stolen car and they're chasing him around the school here. So, but, you know, when, when ground zero happens and it's an actual active shooter, it's hard to differentiate to snap into active shooter mode when you've heard the, the bailout alarm. You know, it's just a sad situation. So um, we have one more voicemail. Then we have a movie. Dean, comrade. It's Sergei from Mother Russia. I'm trying to get to all of Jonathan Bates about his car's extended warranty. If you could give us a call back, Jonathan, it would be very much appreciated, comrade. I'm 10-6. Uh, now, now, he – oh, hold on a second. Do you have any idea how – 
Hold on. I've got a problem. Um, he... Guys, that's just 10 sixes theme music. <laughs> he gets uh, his own no, theme music. Uh, I really appreciate that. Do you have any ideas since the war began? Not to make light of things, but I did buy a, a vehicle from Kamchatka Motors. And it is very difficult to get in touch with anyone about my warranty without like the NSA wondering why I'm constantly calling over there. So I appreciate the diligence and high customer service of Sergey over there at Kamchatka Motors. <laughs> I do know that it, it's authentic, that that, was, that guy was authentically Russian because he said comrade at the end. And that's... Yeah, he's not a newfie. He's obviously from deep, deep central Russia, the main part of Russia, the Cadbury creamy part of Russia, if you will. <laughs> right. Oh, those Cadbury Easter cream eggs are the greatest thing ever made. They are. Uh, Drew kind of already primed the audience for a video we want to show here. Uh, to dispatchers, uh, this is your warning. You will be triggered to feel every single piece of anger that you've ever felt at work. And for civilians or police officers watching, please take careful note as someone trying to accomplish a very important task is torn asunder by activity in the comm center. So the movie says that there's a caller that says, uh, I think my neighbor's house is on fire. And this kind of goes out to all the all people. law enforcement traffic, please hold. We were paging out fire for a structure fire. 526 South copies. Central Fire. EMS. Mutual aid. Structure fire page. copies of traffic. Where are they or in route to? All units, hold your traffic. Hold Sam your traffic. One traffic stop with out of Wisconsin, Orange Ocean, November. Three, five, four. I'll be located on the corner of um, uh, Third and and uh, Maple. Uh, again, I'll, I'll be out on a traffic stop there. Uh, check my status every minute. Last unit, your audio is extremely This is Paul 22. I'll be out at my residence for lunch. Uh, this is Leroy. I just, I just picked up a dog. I'm headed to the pound. Uh, I've got a tag number. It's uh, Adam Fred 3472. Could you tell me the owner of this? i kind of like to get the dog back. This is Tom 21. I was out of the car. What was your traffic? All units, hold your traffic. God damn it. Southside Fire, EMS, Mutual Aid. After that, I just need units to respond for MOP-UP 2352. This is South Central 5543. Uh, our pagers didn't go off. Did we get a page? If so, could you repeat the page for us uh, and return out, everyone? So this is the lament of, of every dispatcher. I'm, like, I'm so angry. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially what happens is... Uh, you tell everyone, hey, stop talking for a second. I, I got to get this information out. The information in this skit, which is pure satire, uh, was that my neighbor's house is on fire or whatever. Somebody called 911. So he wanted to send the tones out to get the emergency people rolling, the proper equipment rolling. And, uh, of course, <laughs> everybody sees the car they want to stop or the dog they want to pick up. And then you have the low talky guy and then you have the screamy guy uh, but what this says at the end is for some this is 100 percent humor for the people that work in a small agency combined dispatch center there's no humor in this at all as it happens way too often it is quite triggering to hear if you are a first responder like law enforcement fire ems clean up your system it starts with you train your personnel maybe ask for a ride along in dispatch and understand a good radio tech makes things work without one minute of paging tones going off before dispatchers can relay the information. And there's actually the second page. Uh, it also says if your radio te uh, if your radio tech can't make it work, get a new tech. Drew. Now this is this is a, <laughs> being addressed to the first responders. 
Uh, asking where fire and or medics are going never helps. If it involved you or required you to be there, you would definitely know. Uh, this isn't time to ask where they're going. Running every plate you can find. This is not the time for that. Treating your microphone as either a lover you are in the throes of passion with, like swallowing your mic, or seeing how far you can keep your mic away from you like it has leprosy uh, while talking in its general direction is just very poor professionalism. So, still... Uh, the film was uh, sent to us by obviously a uh, a member who wanted to remain anonymous, but obviously is uh, attempting to crack into the cinematic world. And uh, I definitely think they're off to a good start. They definitely have nailed the comp centers. Across yeah. The- aside from the music triggering people out there who like podcasts, um, Amanda, what, what did that uh, hearing all that do to you? I know that uh, that's the third time I've heard it and I'm about ready to be talked off a ledge myself in addition to the the music problems there. But what did what did you think hearing that? Was that uh, something that you can relate to? Oh, yeah. No, I'm texting my therapist for an emergency appointment right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh the whole it starts off right away so realistic when you say hey stand by everyone i'm paging out of structure fire you're just asking cops to just be quiet for just a minute where are they going what's the address like they they don't get it you tell them like i need you to st- i can't talk to you stop talking to me and then they immediately just start asking questions because that's them um all right so did everybody hear it or did we uh, I, I'm seeing confusing, conflicting information in the chat. But. Everybody heard it, Drew. I think uh, the the music okay. too was getting played a little bit too loudly. Um, yeah, I that's all, that's all right. It was a great video. It shows everyone kind of what we're dealing with when everything's all happening at once. Uh, another phenomenon that you're seeing there, the dispatchers hate, is uh, called blurting, where someone uh, <laughs> just starts talking to dispatch, and they don't say, "Hey, dispatch, this is John calling you." They don't wait to have someone respond to them. They just start giving information. And maybe you heard at one point, Leroy, the dog catcher, starts reading you a tag number. You know, Adam, Ken, or whatever. He was saying it's like when you're doing something else, you really can't easily copy numbers and letters. And I don't think that police officers or even firefighters really understand that. So please stop blurting. Please wait to be acknowledged. I am now off of my soapbox, Drew. Amanda, please get it off your chest. I mean, lay into, lay into it. Go for it. I have so many thoughts. I just (laughs) don't even know where to start. You know, we're really lucky because we're a small department. Like our law enforcement channel is a single channel. Um, And so we don't, if there's something going on in the county, everybody knows about it. But what that doesn't stop is off-duty people who hear sirens going by (laughs) and are like, oh, hey, is there something going on? If if there is, I don't have time. so it's just it's it's never gonna go away completely but you know those every single extra transmission every single extra question people just need to realize is taking away from the emergency at hand and it it might seem like well why why can't dispatch just tell me really quick well i can (laughs) but i can't tell you and these 72 other people that also want to know at the same time (laughs) you're right stand in line (laughs) yeah it's just one thing after another it's very triggering it's fine Got it. Well, uh, I, I think uh, we've covered all the audiovisual uh, things that we can cover tonight, John. I mean, uh, we had voicemails. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to get to phone calls or not, but um, we'll thank take God uh, we have Amanda here. We'll we'll take uh, questions from the chats. If you're in the chats right now, I'll do my best to pass on questions for Amanda. But Amanda is really here to speak for herself. For the past several weeks, we've been discussing on the show many different incidents, uh, active shooters, tactical situations, domestic disputes gone awry. And throughout it all is the common thread of what's happening to the dispatcher. How do they feel? What are they dealing with? What do they carry home with them when they leave? Uh, What is it like to feel helpless um, when uh, an emergency is going on? And even though you're doing the best you can, it never feels like enough. Uh, We could discuss those things. And I I could tell you some things that I've been through, but you know, to be honest, I haven't been through a lot in my many years. I've been lucky that my mileage is low, even though my years are very high. And so we wanted to bring a dispatcher here onto the show to 
speak for many dispatchers like her and for herself. Amanda, how did you uh, become a number one dispatcher and when was that? So I got my first 911 dispatch job in 2018. Um, I think August, I started two days before my birthday um, in 2018. And I, like many dispatchers that I know, did not intend to become a dispatcher. Um, it was one of those situations where I was bored with the job I had now and uh, found a job posting and was like, that looks really cool. I won't get the job, but you know, might as well apply. And turns out that 911 dispatcher um sometimes there aren't standards for that hiring and then they hired me so that checked out but um that's how i got my start um, never really intended to get into it but fell in love with it right off the bat so and uh you, like me you i believe you came from a retail background is that true yes i was working at walmart at the time which turns out um does give you a lot of conflict resolution skills um, and transferring that into 911 dispatch actually was not as big of a change as I expected. I have to say, I agree. I, I came from Target and we had some of that too. So if your background is something other than law enforcement or call centers or whatever you think that you would need before you would go to 911, I guess I would say we'll take any kind of person that can come in and learn. Uh, so you were working uh, out of a, a nearby uh, agency in, was it 2018 or 2019? that you were first going up against some of the hardest stuff in your career? Yeah, so I um, had started um, at Saunders County in Nebraska. Um, they're in Wahoo, which anyone who isn't from Nebraska, the only town you probably know of is Omaha because that's what everyone references. Um, so Wahoo is just outside of Omaha. It's the neighboring county. Um, and I started there in August of 2018. And the incident that happened was in March of 2019. So I had about six months on. Um, we didn't really have training training at that agency at the time. Um, so I trained officially for a couple weeks um, in August when I started. And then we were a two person dispatch center for the most part. So they basically just paired you up with an experienced person and hoped for the best. Um, and sometimes it was worked, sometimes it didn't. So um, going into March of 2019, we had come out from a one of a really severe Nebraska winter. Um, we had over 50 inches of snow um, for that season and uh, had a large amount still on the ground going into March. And then it had just a huge spike in temperature. Within a week, we went from about eight degrees to 63 degrees across the state, um, which obviously melted all that snow very quickly and uh, caused massive flooding across the state. And uh, we were lucky in Saunders County um, that our county was bordered on two of our sides by the Platte River, which the Platte River literally has no water in it at any other time of the year, um, except for when we have flooding. So the Platte River had flooded up and we were running evacuations pretty much 24 seven, um, that weekend. And, um, we had dispatchers that couldn't even get into the office just because where we were had kind of become an island. Mm -hmm. Um, so just to paint a picture, you know, we're evacuating these uh, these little towns back and forth. And this wasn't something we had dealt with before. Um, so it wasn't the best organized evacuations in the world. We would evacuate these little low lying um, areas. And then a couple hours later, we'd be told flooding went down. They can go home. We'd let everybody go home. And then a little bit later, we'd be told, oh, just kidding. It's flooding again. We got to get them all out. So. That was pretty much our nonstop for a couple of days, um, just getting people in and out, getting people that got thought they could drive through flood water, which you can't, um, and all sorts of different calls back to back. So just going into it very mentally exhausted for everybody. Um, and then the second, I want to say it was the second day of severe flooding, um, one of our deputies who was off duty. Um, he was on the fire and rescue department and he called in and said, Hey, just heads up. I'm going to be taking a team with the rescue department out to assist a neighboring County with a water rescue. And he had an airboat, which is what they were using to get into all these flooded areas. So we mark him out of County, no big deal. Um, the call that they were responding to was a family um, with, I believe three adults and a two year old child. Um, inside a residence that had flooding coming up, they had lost part of the foundation and a couple walls of the house at that point in time when they called. 
Um, so our team went out, um, but again, this is in a neighboring county. So we had marked them out on this call and at that point turned it over to the county that was running that incident, returned to our own stuff. Um, and didn't think much more of it until a little bit later, I got a call from Chris. That was um, his, our deputy's name. Chris called back in and I figured he's going to let me know he's back in, what you got up for me. And instead I answer the phone. He says, Hey, um, so our boat capsized in the river um, and we're going to need some helicopters to get us out. Um, we've got seven firefighters capsized in the river. And I was like, Oh gosh, you know, I'm six months in. I don't know even where to find a helicopter, <laughs> let alone anything else. Um, but, you know, knowing that that was the situation they were in, we're going to figure it out because that's, that's what you learn in dispatch. You don't have to know everything, but you have to know how to find everything. Right. Right. Um, it's resourcefulness. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so we were lucky enough to have a national guard camp that is located in Saunders County. And that was the first thing I thought of was to call the contact number for that. Well, I have no military background. I'm not involved in the military at all. So I get this poor private on the line and he's explaining to me that privates can't launch helicopters. And unfortunately that's um, something he wasn't able to help with. So after dozens and dozens of calls to the state patrol up through the national guard to FEMA, um, I finally get a contact number for the headquarters that FEMA had set up for the flooding. And I get this very nice lady on the phone and she says, Oh, okay. I'll transfer you into the conference room. And all of a sudden I'm on speakerphone in a conference room and they're rattling off these uh, names and titles of everyone that's standing there. And it's like, well, this is the admiral of this and the general of this and the major of this. And I'm like, Oh shit. Okay. This is, this is a big deal. So I tell them what we need and we need helicopters to go pick up our guys out of the river. Now, while all of this is going down, um, I get another call back from, from Chris. Um, and this was when I really knew that something was wrong because when Chris had first called me, he was one of those deputies that he could be in a high speed pursuit with shots fired and he'd sound like he was chilling on his couch watching TV. Very mm -hmm. calm, never got flustered. Um, and so about five minutes after Chris's first call, he called back in and, uh, I answered the phone and he said, Hey, um, I know you guys are doing everything you can. I don't want to bother you, but, um, I don't know what else we can do to get out of here. And having heard Chris always be confident and always calm and he was always in control of the situation. Um, I heard that call and I was just, Oh, Chris is in the water. And at first on that first call, I didn't realize Chris was one of the ones in the water. I had pictured him in my mind that he was standing on the edge of the river watching this happen and calling for help. And then I realized that he's in the water holding onto this capsized airboat while he's calling me. Amanda, uh, is that not, uh, very common though in in the communications world for a 911 emergency call taker or for somebody who's an emergency dispatcher to have to fill in your own blanks like it's just something that comes with the job mm -hmm. because often you don't get the rest of the story or uh, often you're just hearing somebody in in your ear describing what's happening so you kind of have to fill in your own blanks um I mean, do you see that often? Do you feel that often? Oh, absolutely. I think every single call, um, most dispatchers that I know, um, they're painting a mental picture in their head of what this scene is looking like, what we're sending our people into. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's it. sometimes that picture is flawed and there are missing pieces that we're not getting sure. from the caller or from our responders on scene even. And so putting those pieces together is is our job, you know, to to get those extra details and figure out what is going on and what needs to happen. Um, so that was kind of what we were working with, you know, is we're, we had one understanding of the situation and uh, <laughs> walked into something completely different once we realized what was really going on there. Um, so as this is all going on, um, we finally get confirmation from the national guard that they've made two black Hawks available to us um, and are putting well them up in the air. What kind of time frame 
are we talking here? At this I point? want to say from the first phone call we got from Chris to the time that we had a confirmed helicopter in the air was about 30 minutes. That's, I mean, that's amazing. That's, that's incredibly efficient. And uh, I mean, that's, that's the resourcefulness that we talked about a minute ago. Yeah. And I, for a long time, I honestly felt pretty bad about that time frame because um, what I learned later is that Chris and one other individual in that, in those boats, were not wearing wetsuits. Mm. Um, and this is icy cold water, you know, it's sure. just melting off the winter. And um, so sitting there for, for 30 minutes thinking that they're in the water and they could, you know, they're getting hypothermia, they're getting all of these things. Um, and then, I don't know if, you know, anybody's seen like a flash flood or things like that, but we had ice chunks that were coming down thing, huge pieces of trees, huge debris, you know, this house that washed away that every single minute that they're in there, you know, is becoming more and more dangerous for them. So, um, we finally got confirmation that these, these helicopters were up in the air, um, and reached out to, uh, Chris over the radio and let him know we have someone coming for you. Um, I found out later from Chris that his wife was listening to the scanner at that oh. time. And she did not know this was going on. Um, we hadn't run anything about it over the radio until that transmission. Um, when I radioed Chris and said that there were helicopters coming to get them out. And so I later found out that was how his wife found out the situation was going on. Um, but we sat there and, you know, that's for me, the hardest part of dispatch is, when you have sent everyone you possibly can and you just have to sit back and trust that they're going to handle it. Um, it's, it's an awful feeling, you know, cause all you want to do is go fix it. You want to help your people. Um, but you have to sit back and trust that you have done absolutely everything you can. And during this, you know, we, we still have everybody else that's calling in, you know, saying, well, when are you going to open back the highway to Omaha? I have to get to Omaha for a doctor's appointment in the morning. How am I going to get there? And all these questions and having to be professional with them and not just shut them down and say, you don't understand what I'm dealing with. Leave me alone. Um, That's a brilliant point. That I mean, perhaps something I never thought of, but uh, uh, experienced on a, probably about a thousand occasions uh, that, that never really thought of it in the most traumatic and dramatic um, things that happen in that profession, uh, people, life still goes on for, for people. People still lock their poodles in the car and they call and expect to have the same level of service that everybody else. And you just want to reach through the phone and tell them you have no idea what's how heavy my, my mind is right now. Like mm -hmm. I am just trying to save somebody's life. And, uh, I mean, that that's such a poignant point that you, you brought out. Yeah, I think it's 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 part of our job, you know, and and to to provide that professionalism to everyone that calls, because just because it's not an emergency to us doesn't mean it's not an emergency to them. Right. And, you know, to them, it's the biggest part of their day. And, and we can still help figure that out now. People abuse the system for sure, but that's true. you know, that's, there's, that's there's true. a line there. And I think we, we learn where that is for sure. But um, yeah, so um, eventually I, I want to say their flight time was about 15 minutes from where they launched. Um, and we basically just sat there and waited and finally got a radio transmission from Chris that said, you know, we're, everyone's in the helicopter. We're cold, but we're safe and we're going to be okay. And, uh, at that point, then we found out they were all going to be transported to the hospital. Um, and one of my favorite parts of the night was the hospital was in a neighboring county and that neighboring county sent all of their units to shut down traffic, um, from the landing zone to the hospital. So they had a straight shot, um, to get them all in there. And, uh, you know, they, they all made a full recovery. Um, like I said, Chris and one other person were not wearing wetsuits, so they had some hypothermia they had to be treated for. Um, but Chris was one of those guys and the next morning he was back out on water rescues again. Ooh. So wow. <laughs> he's just one of those people that always has to be out, you know, getting out there helping and, and no matter what's going on. So, um, that was, uh, the first, like what I would call critical incident that I had ever handled. 
you know, as a, as about six months into, to working as a dispatcher. And I had no idea what to do with that. Um, so I remember driving home that night just in complete silence. You know, I don't remember a whole lot of the drive, just, just completely in shock of what had just happened. Um, got home, went straight to bed and I woke up the next morning and I could just feel that this one was different than calls I had handled in the past. Mm. You know, I, I had taken some bad calls, but usually ones that I would wake up the next morning and it's already in the back of my mind, you know, I've put it away. Um, but because this was someone that I knew and that I cared about for whatever reason, you know, it was hanging with me. And so I had texted our chief deputy at the time and said, Hey, what am I supposed to do with a call that I can't get out, get over that I, I think I might need some help with. And he told me to call him. So I did. And we talked through the call and, you know, he assured me, you know, you did everything right. You know, there, you, it had a good ending. And that's what I was really struggling with was this had a positive ending. Why does this still bother me? Like right. this was a win. <laughs> it shouldn't be sticking with me like this. <laughs> um, but moving through the next few days, I was just dealing with those immediate kind of trauma responses that we see, um, unable to keep food down, unable to sleep, you know, all of those things that were just inhibiting daily function. So thankfully my chief deputy set me up with our EAP program, um, to get a visit with a counselor. Um, I did that, but again, I was very naive with how trauma works and how the brain works. Um, and so I thought that two visits with a counselor would just fix it. So I went I'm to cured. See, yeah, 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 exactly. I went to see the counselor twice. And I think that was a span of about three weeks. And three weeks later, I know it wasn't, I was able to eat. I was able to sleep. So it's fixed. Everything's fine. Like I'm good to go. Um, but I wasn't spoiler alert. Um, so I went along with, you know, with my life and continued to work and, didn't see those, what I now understand were PTSD symptoms until about, I want to say two to three months later, um, after that incident. So what I began to notice was just very simple calls, very simple things at work that I could not let go. Um, for example, there was one night where I had made a very, like a small error at work, you know, something where your supervisor's just going to come say, Hey, you messed up on this call. Don't do it again. This is what you'll do next time. Not a big deal. Um, and I worked that up in my mind to be, I'm going to be fired. My life is over. <laughs> um, this, I, you know, I just totally, I totally yeah. identify with that. Like everything is a calamity. Everything yeah. is just like the world crashing in on you and everything is your fault by the mm -hmm. way. Like, and it's not, it, it's, it's sometimes it's just honest critique or, you know, sometimes it's just, they don't understand what you're going through and they just kind of throw something out, but it is the weight of the world on your shoulders already. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's only so much hard drive space that you have. And then they throw that little bit of information in there and it, it envelops the rest of the, the hard drive and, and more. So I, I get, I totally get that. I totally yeah. understand where you're coming from. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I started to notice that with this, this particular mistake, you know, it was, it was something that I knew was going to be resolved very easily and in, in, in my, the logical side of my brain. Um, but that night I left work and I started driving and I just, my thoughts just started to spiral, you know, and um, I went from, this is a small mistake to, this is going to end my career. My life is over. I don't have anything to live for. And I don't remember a whole lot of that drive, but what I do remember is ending up I was parked in my car on the side of a bridge over the interstate and I got out of the car and almost without like any control, any thoughts in my mind, I walked over and climbed on the edge of the bridge mm. and I was sitting there crying and just thinking about, you know, what, where, what is happening in my mind? What is going on right now? Um, and that night some deputies from the County obviously got called. And so they came out and, were very kind and understanding and talked to me about what was going on and told me, you know, you need to talk to someone about this. This isn't a normal reaction to what you're going through. You know, you need to, you need to tell someone this is going on. 
so I went home that night and the next day I went into work and I went into my supervisor's office and I said, Hey, um, I don't really know what to do. I'm not really sure what's going on, but you know, that mistake that I made yesterday, like I've got myself so worked up over this that I spent an hours last night on a bridge over the interstate. And I think I might need some help. And she looked like she didn't know what to do with that information. And she said, oh, sweetie, it's okay. It, it, there's no need to get that worked up over it. You'll be fine. <laughs> okay. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and walked back out and finished my shift. Um, and honestly, at that point, that was where I felt most alone because I felt like I had done what I needed to do. I tried to reach out. I knew I needed some help. Um, but it just wasn't, it wasn't available. Um, and so from that point forward, I just thought that, you know, this is a part of my life now I need to figure it out, but I can't talk about it. I can't ask for help because it's just not available to me. Um, and so over the next couple months, those, those nights became more and more frequent. Those symptoms became more and more regular. I would anything that happened at work, I would go for a drive afterwards to process and would just end up spiraling into these thoughts and feeling like I was out of control. And so many nights I have a, I have a map in a presentation that I give about this for conferences that shows all of the places that I would just end up one night. I have no memory of how I got there. I ended up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I mean, wow just driving for hours and hours and I'd end up on a bridge, on a parking garage, wherever, just absolutely suicidal and wanting to end my life. And it just got to a point where I couldn't keep it hidden anymore. You know, I'm, I'm still functioning as an, as a dispatcher, I'm going out at night and sitting on a bridge over the interstate and then coming back into my job the next day and answering calls from people who are suicidal. Like, it's not a maintainable lifestyle, you know, and I knew I needed help, but I felt so humiliated that I had let myself get to this point that I didn't feel like I could speak up. Um, until, uh, we had a night where I was working with another dispatcher and without getting into a whole lot of detail, I had found out something that he had done with a call that in my mind, I was, I felt like was putting people's lives at risk. Um, and because of the thought process that I had let myself get into over these months was everything is my responsibility. And if I don't fix this, it is my fault if somebody gets hurt or dies. And so I left work that night, same thing, started driving, trying to process all of these thoughts and everything. And I started spiraling into, if you can't fix this, what are you doing here? Like, you're worthless. You shouldn't be in this job. Why are you here? And it just went down this whole rabbit hole of thinking to the point where suddenly I was having these thoughts of, I wonder if it would hurt less if I shot myself in the head or in the heart. Mm. And I had that thought and it kind of shocked me back <laughs> to reality. And I thought, whew, yikes. Okay. Um, that's not good. But it's fine because I don't have, I don't have a gun with me, so it'll be okay. You know, whatever. I'll deal with this later. Well, um, at that point I remembered that I had put my gun in my vehicle the day before to go to the range and had never taken it out. So now I'm realizing I'm overwhelmed of having these thoughts and now I have the means to carry them out if I want to do it. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe tonight's the night. Like I just, I can't do this anymore. And so I pulled over at um, a way station outside of Lincoln, Nebraska, and parked my car. And I'm thinking, you know, do I want to just do this now and just get it over with? Um, So as a last ditch effort, I decided to reach out to um, the suicide hotline. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, worst case scenario, this is my last day on earth. What does it hurt to be brutally honest with some random stranger, you know, and, and, and just see what's out there. Um, so I'm communicating with the suicide hotline and tell them everything that's going on. And, you know, they have to ask those safety questions, you know, and they ask, you know, are you thinking about ending your life? I said, yeah, absolutely. And they're like, okay, well, what do you plan on doing? Plan on shooting myself. 
okay, do you have a firearm? Yes. So at that point in time, you know, they say, well, we need to contact emergency services. Either you do it or we do it, which it doesn't really make sense because I, I basically, I tell them, you know, I'll, I'll contact emergency services. I'll get myself some help. And I end the conversation. Um, and then I sat there and I was thinking, you know, I don't have to call in on myself. I can just make my decision and drive away now if I want to. Um, but I really, there was something still there that I felt like I wanted to make one last dish effort to really see if I could get help. And I pretty much made up my mind if it didn't work tonight, then I'd be done. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did call our local dispatch center. I called 911, um, which important to dis to point out, this was not the county I worked for that I was in at the time. Um, I called 911 and told the dispatcher, you know, that I was considering uh, suicide and that I had a firearm. And so the local sheriff's office comes out. Um, one of the lowest points of my life, um, because, you know, we all know how that works when you have a firearm, you know, they pull you out at felony stop and that sure. whole process. And I remember going through that. And as I'm sitting in the back of this deputy's cruiser, mm. I just remember thinking, how did I get here? Like, <sighs> I'm supposed to be one of the good guys. Like, I'm supposed to be on the other side of this call right now. How am I the one that's the bad guy here? How am I the danger, you know? and it was just absolutely rock bottom. Um, but again, those deputies were so kind and so understanding and listened to the whole story of everything that had happened over the last few months. And they took me to the hospital. Um, and unfortunately, here's where the mental health system in America is horrible. Um, because I got to the hospital at approximately... I would say three, three or 4 a.m. And I was discharged by eight o'clock with my firearm. <laughs> um, so as I walked away from that, I went home and I, I thought, OK, I, I know that I need to get help now because this is not something that I can handle on my own. I went home and slept and then went in for my shift that afternoon um, and sent an email to the admin at my department and said, I need to make you aware of this incident that happened last night. I think I really need some more help. Um, could we set up a meeting to talk about this and see what we need to do? So I had a meeting with them that week. Um, after that meeting, I was placed on admin leave and told to go get a psyche valve. Um, <clears throat> I went ahead and got this psyche valve. And then I was told, hey, you're going to be on admin leave until we get the results back with no timeline, no understanding of what was about to go on, I'm sitting at my apartment in Lincoln for a month with no contact, no follow-up. Um, and this is October when I've been placed on admin leave. So I have no updates from my department for about a month as I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs doing nothing in my apartment um, until the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. And that day I get a call from the sheriff at about three o'clock in the afternoon. And he says, hey, we got the results back of your psyche valve. Um, they're not good. We don't believe that you should come back to our department. You'll have your termination letter in the mail in about a week. Oh, my God. Um, and so I hung up the phone with him and called a couple of the deputies that I had good relationships with to say goodbye. Um, you know, thanks for working together and all of this. And I've been let go. Um, and then I went over to my sister's house for a couple hours and cried on her couch, left her house, wrote a suicide note on my phone um, and just started driving. I didn't have a plan. I just knew I was done because my last support group that I had was that department. You know, I had close friends. I had supports that I would talk to about all these calls and now it had been yanked out from under me. Um, so wrote a suicide note, started driving and I had called, um, an acquaintance of mine that worked for the department where I was at, um, and had told him that I was considering suicide. And I was like, you know, Hey, this is what happened. I got let go from my department and I can't live anymore. I don't have anything else to stick around for. Um, and as honestly, divine intervention would have it. 
it was the height of grant season for DUIs and I was driving with my with a headlight out. So I got pulled over as I'm on the phone with this friend and I tell him, hey, I'm getting pulled over. I, I got to go. So I get pulled over and the officer comes up and gets my information, goes back to his vehicle. And I'm just waiting for him to, you know, here's your warning for your headlight, your fix it ticket, whatever, move on. Um, well, he's taking a really long time and he comes back up to the window and dispatchers and law enforcement will get this. I'm watching in my mirror and I see that he, as he's coming up, he's putting his gloves on. And I'm like, oh, that's not a great sign. Usually it's, you know, doesn't usually mean you're about to get a warning. Um, so he comes up to the window and he says, hey, when I ran your name over the radio, I got a call from a friend um, that said, maybe we need to talk about some other stuff that's going on tonight. And he was like, did you write a suicide note tonight? And I said, yeah. And I showed it to him and um, he went ahead and took me to the hospital that night. Um, I did not get out in four hours that night. I was there for about 48 hours or so. Um, but again, one of the lowest points of my life, um, the facility that we have for mental health emergencies in Lincoln, which is where I was at at the time. Um, it's very similar to jail. Um, you get a room and they check on you a couple times a day. They don't check on you for meals. You know, I, I, I sat there. I did not leave that room for 48 hours. Um, I saw a psychiatrist for five minutes the last day that I was there. Um, he said, you're good to go. Sign me out. And I got discharged. So unfortunately, um, at that point, then I was I was discharged, which was great, but I had no resources and I had no job. And it was now um, I want to say it was the day after Thanksgiving at this. Yeah, it would have been the Friday after Thanksgiving at this point. So I'm going into the holiday season trying to figure out what am I doing? Like, where do I go from here? Um, I was unemployed through the full month of December, um, into mm -hmm. January. And honestly, just continued to hit even further rock bottom than I thought I could find. Um, I turned into the frequent flyer that we all hated. Um, I genuinely just felt like I had nothing to live for. I was suicidal constantly. Um, law enforcement was called out for me on a weekly basis, if not more than that. Um, and I just, during that time, I was just lost. I had no motivation to try to get a job, to try to move on because I felt like everything that I had lived for was gone. Um, and then the last time that the Lincoln police department had to come out to talk to me, this one officer came out and I'll never forget what he told me because I was really mad about it at first, but he looked at me and he said, Amanda, you know, every time that you call, we're going to come out here because, you know, that's our job and we're here to help. And I'm not saying that we won't, but you have it better than a lot of people. You still have an apartment. You still have a car. You're still self-sufficient. And he's like, don't let yourself get away from that. He's like, you can still turn this around, but he's like, we can't do it for you. Us coming out here every week, it is what it is and we're going to do it, but that's not going to fix your what's really going on until you take ownership of your own mental health and you decide that you don't want to live this way, then we're just going to keep coming out here. And it irritated me at first because what I heard was you're a problem and we don't want to deal with you. But when I walked inside, I thought about what he said and I realized he was right. And that night I got on my phone and I looked up therapists in my area. And that night I made an appointment with the therapist that I still see today. Mm -hmm. Um, so within a few weeks, I got in with that therapist. Um, and honestly, what I like to tell people who are dealing with things like this, that feel so overwhelming and so life ending. Um, I saw that therapist, I want to say two to three times before I was no longer having weekly crises. Um, just because those things that were overwhelming me were able to be dealt with, with just simple coping skills and processing through that and learning how to handle my own thoughts. It didn't solve everything. I still have, I still have plenty of issues. Um, but learning how to take myself from a crisis state and at least bring it down to where it's manageable and, um, 
it is just a huge, huge difference. And so after that time, um, I want to say about a month after I started seeing that therapist, um, I started working with air methods dispatch, which dispatches air medical helicopters across the 50 States. Um, did that for about two years. And while I was there, um, I found Burke County Sheriff's Office um, because I wanted to know if I could handle 911 dispatch again. I always wanted to get back into it, but I wasn't honestly wasn't sure if I could ever even get hired in in 911. But I came up here; they were hiring for a part time position, and I walked into the interview and was brutally honest with them about everything that had happened and said, "You know, this is this is where I was. This is what happened at my last apartment." This is what I've done and this is where I'm at now. Um, and I cannot say enough good things about the sheriff and the chief deputy up here. Um, just understanding those kinds of things and what what we go through and um, just being incredibly supportive of my mental health journey and being willing to be there and just, just support me through all of it. Um, I told John this week, actually, that this last weekend I had a, I had a bad mental health weekend and I, without a doubt, can, I I called our chief deputy, my old department. I never would have felt comfortable calling them and saying, Hey, I'm having a bad weekend with my mental health. But here, you know, I, I called our chief deputy and I said, Hey, this is what's going on. I'm okay, but here's where I'm at, you know, and here's what's going on with my, with, with my brain and everything and where I'm at mentally. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're just incredibly supportive. So that the difference in agency has made such a huge difference. And um, now I'm full-time here. I don't work at Air Methods anymore, but um, yeah, that's kind of the full circle of where everything's come and gone from, from the last five years now. Dang. Yeah. It's the, the literal difference between life and death sometimes is mm-hmm. a little compassion that goes a long way from uh, whether it's an administrator or a coworker or whatever. I, oh, first of all, I commend you on your bravery. Thank you very much for being here and speaking as frankly and um, as honest as, as you're being. Uh, I, I can tell you um, I've been in similar situations over similar reasons, and um, it's, it's never easy to talk about. I, I can also tell you that, uh, or, or let me rephrase that. I should probably ask you when you, and it's just, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but when you finally found the therapist that clicked or when you finally found the mental health professional that, that uh, resonated with you the most, was it somebody that had been trained in first responder trauma or was it just, just somebody who had like an extra level of compassion? Um, so he does uh, EMDR therapy. Wow. Um which is something that I had heard incredible things about through um, first responder support groups and stuff. Um, so that was yeah. what I specifically searched out. Um, and he, he's not, he doesn't advertise for first responders, but he does work with a large amount of them. So, yeah. Uh, EMDR is if, from what I understand, I mean, it's, it's to draw the, uh, the trauma out of you through I uh, EMD. I'm trying to figure, uh, remember uh, what the eye movement um Amanda, you should just tell us. <laughs> it's eye movement desensitization <laughs> reprocessing. Wow. So, um, and, and you know, I know people that have gone through this. And uh, actually, there was a, a social media post within the last week where, uh, you know, he was a, a former police officer and military veteran. And he was singing the praises of this EMDR that that just like I never in a million years thought that this mm-hmm. could do anything. And, you know, just in one session, I was just completely blown away about by uh, how I'm able to process things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Um, I've I've also heard just amazing things. And um, I guess to to anyone listening, uh, I I haven't been through EMDR myself, but if you are struggling with something, maybe look into that as an option, just because I have heard so many great things. And you heard it from Amanda herself that, uh, you know, that that was helpful, helpful for her. Man, it's always a very hard story for me to hear because I consider you a friend and it's never, I, I, my heart just goes out to you hearing all that stuff because you're not only an amazing professional, but you're an amazing human being. And it, it hurts me to think that you would ever be in the place that, you know, that you would think such uh, terrible and lonesome thoughts. And I'm, I'm really grateful for you to, I'm grateful that you're still around 
and I'm grateful that you can share. And I guess I'm I'm also grateful to Burke County Sheriff's Office that they let you go out and you be an example of someone that can be open and honest. You know, when you were talking to your first sheriff's office, you know, they uh, they responded by protecting themselves and taking away the main thing that gave you purpose and drive in your life, which, uh, you know, was when I when I've been down and when I've been having problems like that, one thing that helps me is is having that drive and that purpose at work. And so I'm, I'm glad for, for Burt County that, uh, you know, that you can, you can talk about these things and be an example to others. And, um, if there are other dispatchers out there, you know, I just, I just want to lift you up as an example as someone that can, you can go that far and then you can, you can come back and you're not only dispatching 911 again, but you know, you're in charge and it's, it's an amazing journey. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, so I just kind of, I'm curious, uh, the, the, when you finally came back, I know that you were trying to get back into the profession that mm -hmm. you wanted to get in. Like maybe it was just a scratch, uh, an itch that hadn't been scratched fully or whatever, but uh, were you a little skittish uh, when that, when the tone went off in your ear the first time, or uh, were you just like, look, I, I just want to jump right back into the deep end of this pool and let's whatever happens happens. Yeah. I, it's something that I feel like I don't notice um, in the moment with calls um, just because I, it's just a dispatcher reflex. I think, you know, when you're in the middle of that call, your adrenaline kicks in and you're just, you're just focused on what you need to do next. Um, but it's definitely something that I keep in the back of my mind when I have a call that is similar. Um, a lot of times if I have something where an officer gets assaulted or something like that, um, it can set off those old feelings of I, I'm out of control and I don't know how to fix this. Um, and so just being really aware of the baggage that you carry into your calls um, is huge. And when I have a call like that, where I feel like I I'm, this one's going to stick with me. Um, I either try to talk about it with a friend, talk about it with a coworker. Um, and a lot of times I'll hit up my therapist right away and say, Hey, I'm going to need an appointment next week. Like we've got some stuff we need to go through, but yeah. really being proactive and identifying those calls before you let them get as far as I did, you know, in, in, at my old department. So had you had any resiliency training before you started at either agency? Absolutely no. not. No, uh, I, I think that's something else we lack in the profession is, mm -hmm. is preparing. I mean, you, you know, there's this fine line of, uh, of just throwing a bunch of gore at a, at a week one dispatcher that you're trying to train just to like kind of shock or desensitize them or like hey this is what you're getting ready to get into um and you know and then there's two arguments to that uh one that well we don't want to drive away we already have a high turnover rate but then the other side of that is well if they're not ready for that then maybe we are kind of doing them the favor before we kind of ruin them mentally like that's that's what happened to you i mean you were knocked off your mental uh, track for, for quite a while. I mean, and it took a lot of hard work and honesty and integrity and within yourself to get back on track. So, um, I, I don't think that we do enough of the preparation work, uh, in the profession, to be honest with you. Yeah. And one thing I'll say, you know, just when I, when I talk about this, I do try to be gracious towards my old department. You know, there's stuff that I wish that they had done differently, but there's also things that I wish I would have done differently, you know, in communicating, um, what I needed and what was going on. Um, and I think that it's such a difficult situation for anybody to be put in, you know, I didn't know how to handle it. So, you know, I can't, ex I can't expect them to also know how to handle it. And so it was the first time they'd been faced with a situation like that. Um, so I can understand, you know, especially from an administrative perspective, they always are thinking about liability and all of those things. So, uh -huh. um, I do try to see it from their perspective. And I, I think that in their minds, they were trying to handle it the best that they could for the department as a whole. Um, but I just hope that they can take that as a learning experience, you know, is that we can, we can protect our department um, and think about liability and consider all of those factors while also caring about our people. Um, and again, to just point at Burt County, um, you know, when I started here, they asked for a letter from my therapist just to have on file saying that, you know, I'm taking care of my mental health. I'm doing what I need to do. And that's all they've really ever asked of me is just communication. You know, how are you doing mentally? Um, do you need anything from us and all of those things? So 
they have the papers to cover their liability, but they're also caring about me as a person. And that's what really makes the difference at the end of the day. The, the, I, I can understand why that makes the, I mean, it's going to make you feel comfortable. Like I, I get probably too, that you're just like, look, I'm transparent about it. I mean, I'll, I'll tell anybody that'll listen. Cause I, that's kind of how I am too. Like in my journey back from the depths, I, like, I'm pretty much an open book. There's, there's a lot of stuff that I've said uh, on podcasts or that I've written about in uh, you know, on my sub stack or whatever that, you know, I, I, I just never imagined I would let anybody know. I, I see a common theme, a couple of common themes in the chat here. One is how everybody is just like so uh, grateful and, and amazed that, that, you know, and, and just thankful for your, uh, your courage and the way you, you've shared the story. The other is just kind of um, how we all get there. You, me, John, and, and some of these other guys in the chats, uh, men and women, like, we're masters at compartmentalization. You even said like you, you, your turn of phrase, your choice of words was, well, I was able to just put that in the back of my mind. And, and that's literally what you're doing. You're putting it in the back of your mind and it's just getting stuff down there. It's not getting dealt with. So um, if I could give anybody advice or if you could offer any advice, I, I'm sure you'd agree that you got to get it out of you. you. You only have, you know, just use whatever stupid metaphor you have to your, your heart can only is a bucket it can only take so many tears and before it starts overflowing use whatever um verbal cue you got but listen you're not going to be able to hide you're not hiding that from anybody trust me like i i spent uh quite a few years of my first marriage in isolation uh just completely isolated in my favorite chair i know that there's um you know in the the dr gil martin book there's talk about the the chair that you just sit in to kind of zone out in. And I spent years and years and years and years in that because I didn't want to bring any harm to my, my wife. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk about it to her I, out of protection for her. And then two selfishly, I just don't want to talk about it. Like, Holy shit. Um, I do think though, what cops miss out on. And I, and this is why I think that you're so important in this conversation and John too, like what, what cops miss out on is the, the the dispatcher's feeling that it, it's an extra sense of thinking that you're marching somebody to their death. And that's kind of w w the sense I got from um, when you're trying to arrange for Black Hawk helicopters to save somebody who you know well. Uh, do, you, do you get that sense even today when you're uh, dealing with officers on the radio or? Yeah, I, I really like the way you put that. Honestly, it's, um, that's a good way to think about it because just that feeling when you know, you, you've heard the situation, you know, they haven't heard that. And a lot of times when I'm sitting there and I listen to it and you, you think in your mind, this is not going to be good. Like this, this is going to be a bad situation. And you, especially in a small department, when you have close relationships with these, these guys and girls, like you're sending your friends over there you know, knowing that this is a dangerous situation that they're walking into. And, you know, we, we trust them, you know, obviously like I, they're all badasses and they're going to handle it, but you know, they're, it, it, it's, it's a hard feeling to deal with and um, to be able to just set that aside in your mind and be a professional and do your job um, at the end of the day. But also, like you said about compartmentalizing, I think it's just important to um, be able to, sorry, um, <laughs> you're, you're someone keeps like calling me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, it's just important to be able to be proactive with that and recognize um, that compartmentalizing is great, but it's a temporary solution, um, and you can't shut that away forever. So you know whether it's going to therapy, whether it's having a friend that you talk to about these things and you process it and get it out, whatever works for you, have something because you can't afford to just shove that down until it blows up in your face. Uh, before I turn this over to John, because I've kept him way too quiet for way too long. Uh, we just want to be clear. That's not the 911 line ringing. Correct. 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 It is my cell phone. <laughs> uh, yeah. She's, she's important. I'm sure stuff's going on and we're lucky to, to get her for as, as long as we have. She's there in the comm center now in Burt County, keeping it all together. And, uh, it's just an amazing story and uh you're so you're so good at telling it amanda i, I feel like uh, at any moment where uh 
you can just take over for me. You know, you could just step on in. I think you do a better job of articulating what it's like to be a 911 dispatcher than I ever could. And I remember when I first met you, we were out in, in training and um, you were just an open book about it. And I think it was, you know, we were there for a week and it didn't take you very long to tell me that story. And I, I, I just remember first hearing that from you. And I just thought like, you, you just got the heart of a hero. You know, you make me, you make me sometimes feel like uh, sometimes the job gets me down or I get very cynical, but uh, when I meet and talk to people like you, uh, it's it's uplifting, not just because of where you've come back from, but just because of the heart that you have for the job. And there's so many people that do have a heart for the job and that are are in it because they want to help their friends and their neighbors and and make a difference like you. And it is very inspiring. I appreciate you. Are. You. You're you're an, you're, you're incredible. I, I'm eternally grateful for you sharing for that. I, I think this is kind of a turning point for this show. This is. This is what I envision. I mean, I, I, it doesn't need to be heavy every single day or every single episode or every, every single week. It doesn't need to be fun and campy every single episode and every single week either because Amanda's story is one of a trillion. And, and a lot of times agencies, they do it to cops, they do it to firefighters, they do it probably way more on average to dispatchers. You're expendable. And, and, you know, she sacrificed her, like she didn't walk into this job. Most of the time, by the way, there is psychological testing for dispatchers. I don't know if that agency did that, but you're walking into this job with a clean slate and halfway through it, six months into it, you're like, man, something's not right. And, and, you know, you look at that PTSD checklist and you're like, yep, that, 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 that I'm short with everybody. I'm short, you know, like. Hostile, and, hostile, and you're in a room full of people who are in the same boat. That everybody is hostile with one another. I mean, the cops aren't necessarily kind to you, or the firefighters sometimes. The citizens definitely aren't kind to you because they're in some weird crisis anyway. And and then we tend to kind of turn on each other because we haven't really dealt with these issues, you know, yet, uh, or or we're starting to at least. In in your story, like in your uh, you, you being an advocate is what's helping all of this. That's what's kind of, that's, what's going to break the dam. That's what's, that's what it's going to take. John, do you have uh, any other? So, uh, well, actually what I wanted to get to um, you two in common have the negotiations training. So we talked a lot about where Amanda has been and actually where John has been. And let's talk about, uh, where you are. I mean, you're certified negotiators and uh, I, that's a huge accomplishment. I mean, uh, does that, um, d does that experience of being on the brink of suicide more than once help you in the, uh, you know, in your negotiations with people? Oh, a thousand percent. You know, when I got back into 911 dispatch, that was one of the number one things was, you know, this was a, a, a horrible part of my life that I, I would like to close the book on and, you know, and walk away from, but it's also something that not very many people in this field have been, you know, the, the caller or been talked down off a bridge or those kinds of things, you know? Um, and so I wanted to make sure that I didn't let those experiences go to waste. Um, and so coming back in there, I did have officers and deputies that were fantastic and made me feel valued and made me want to stay. And I had ones that made me want to jump off the bridge. So, you know, mm -hmm. recognizing that um, when I came back into this field, it was that was one of my number one priorities was I want to find a way to use these experiences to help other people that are going through the same thing. Um, and I think one of the coolest things that came out of that, um, I think John knows this story, is one of the officers when I was um, in Omaha that talked me off a bridge. Um, I went to a negotiations training last year or two years ago um, in Iowa, and he was at that training. Wow. And I was able to go over and talk to him, and he remembered me. Um, we were able to talk about that night and uh, took a picture together and just had a great, like, full circle moment of, you know, this is what happened. I went through this situation, and now here we are both training alongside each other and using that experience to help other people moving forward. So it's been a cool full circle moment. You know, that's, 
that's the validation that um that that you probably you know wouldn't have been exposed to normally but that's that's great for a cop to be able to like look at you in the eye and say man i remember that night you were in a different place and i i'm i'm fuck i'm glad you're here you know i, I mean that's that's kind of what you know we all do uh whatever we do we you know there's a reason behind it and i'm sure that's a major reason why most of us do what we do mm -hmm. That's just amazing that uh, he was, you know, able to help not just such a, a wonderful person, but a person, but contribute so much more to the greater law enforcement mission because of kind of the role that you play. You know, I'm like I said, I'm just so glad that you're still here with us and and paying it forward. Everything that you know, the chances that or the uh, the help that you were given from from that negotiator and negotiations itself is an amazing discipline. And I'm very glad to have been in it so I could meet you. And I, I wish I could do that more. And I know that uh, you're kind of a top dog negotiator, so I look up to you in that arena as well. Um, I, I know to wrap up, uh, I, I know that John has a brain bigger than his skull and it, it comes out in the form of a beard. That's actually <laughs> part of his brain that you're seeing. Uh, and so his creative side uh, just is, is the artistry is, is the, you know, is him drawing. He's an amazing insanely good uh artist that he's insanely good at uh capturing a, an expression or a moment in my opinion and you know if you've never seen if you're listening to this and you've never seen uh, at difficult to look at pictures on instagram uh or you've never seen my uh avatar on which is not ai generated it was generated by john uh what, what i understand that you have a few outlets also that you're multi-talented do you uh, still participate in music? And, you know, if so, what do you do? Um, you know, music is something that I have not been doing as much lately, but I would like to. Um, but yes, that's definitely one of my uh, my outlets. Um, I, I play a few different musical instruments um, and it's just it's just a fun way to let it out. And I write music and that's a really therapeutic way to process through. There's so many songs that I wrote while I was going through all of that that um, even like I said, this last weekend was a rough one for me mentally. And I had a, a song that I wrote pop up on my Facebook memories. That was literally something I wrote when I was feeling a very similar way a couple of years ago and sitting there and listening to that song. I was like, wow, the, this could not have come up at a better time. So, um, yeah, stuff like that, um, is definitely a huge to just make sure that you have an outlet, um, to, to process these things or just when you need to not be thinking about all of this, you know, for a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing lately, like I can't believe I'm saying this cause I hate, I hate physical exercise of any kind, but I've been getting into the gym lately. Um, and that's been a really good positive coping skill for me. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Finding things like that is great. Yeah. I, I do the same thing too. And I, I've always liked to draw, but I started drawing more in earnest uh, when I was working at 911. I remember I was working this really bad, I think it was even a fatality on the interstate and I was super stressed out and I had like a sticky note in front of me and I was just doing a lot of things automatically, listening, paging that, doing this and the other thing. And when it was all over, the situation was stabilized. It sounds uh, cheesy and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. Going, That's a pretty cool picture of Spider-Man I just drew. <laughs> and it was because like, you know, I was like, uh, I wasn't thinking about what I was doing. So it was just somehow kind of kind of came out of me and that got me very interested in and in pursuing more withdrawing. So it's it's funny how stress and creativity kind of go hand in hand or uh, the one can help you out with the other. And I'm, I'm not multi-talented like mu music wise, but. It is interesting. And I, I hope that if you are stressed out and if you're a police officer or a dispatcher, you know, find something like that that can help you. I I also hate running, but I'm also at the gym running <laughs> to help deal with my stress too. Uh, I am not. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I just deal with the stress raw. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough, uh, Amanda. I mean, I, I've tried, uh, but I, I think that your work's going to you know, carry on, especially in this podcast will be a common thing. I, I, you're going to be an anchor point or a lighthouse, however you want to put it again. I'm not good with the metaphors tonight, but um, this is uh, this was a poignant discussion and I, I, I commend your bravery. And you know what I, I commend the most as somebody who's kind of been there. I, let me tell you a quick story. There are a couple of things that I identify uh, with you on first 
my uh, traumatic, most traumatic event as a dispatcher, one of my most traumatic events involved a helicopter and it was uh, an officer that was killed in the helicopter because they called into the comm center where I was working and uh, it's kind of a long story, but the, the bottom line is they were looking for our agency's helicopter to go shine a light in the bay to look for this uh, firefighter who had been, who had capsized a couple days earlier. And I, I, I told him it was, it was, you know, I don't think anybody's going to have a problem with it, but I need to get permission because it's not our jurisdiction. And of course they were like, no, 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 no. I, it was the coast guard. They were like, I understand jurisdiction more than anybody. Let me call the Tampa police department. And he called the Tampa police department and the Tampa police department sent their chopper out and it went down and it killed uh, the pilot and, and one of the guys that was on board who was just an observer. He was a canine guy who had a knee injury or something and he couldn't swim. And, uh, it's, uh, that was 30 years ago and it stuck with me, uh, like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I mean, and then just something else that jogged my memory, uh, and I'm, this isn't a one up, but I'm just saying there are things, uh, th there are a lot more in common than not mm -hmm. in, in your yeah. story that I have. I, I, uh, I turned myself kind of over, like I gave surrender to, uh, I tried to check into rehab, alcohol rehab, and I was turned away. Uh, like I spent most of my alcoholic life waiting for that moment to check into alcohol rehab and they, they turned me the fuck away. Um, you know, luckily I was still game uh, a day or two later because they finally had a bed for me. But, uh, you know, I, I just want to tell you the, the resiliency, not necessarily the mental health resiliency, but the resiliency to stick to something that Amanda has demonstrated, something I'm trying to tell you, uh, when you get that feeling or when you get that notion that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, just be sick and tired of being sick and tired and go get help. Recognize it. Just be honest with yourself. It, it's okay. Um, you know, I hate that. I'm not a big fan of the, uh, uh, it's okay to not be okay. Uh, I, I'm really not a big fan of that phrase, but, um, it, it really is a normal reaction that you had. I mean, how else do they know, how else would they be able to prognosticate or, or, or predict what your symptoms are on a stupid little check sheet if millions of people haven't been through this already? Mm -hmm. So when you start feeling these things like irritability, you're isolating, you don't want to talk to your family anymore, you're self-medicating more and more, it's time to quit fucking around and compartmentalizing and it's time to dump that bucket out of your soul and get get your butt somewhere uh, talk to uh, talk to anybody. Talk to Amanda for God's sake. Speaking of which, uh, are you public? Like, do you have a, a place where people can publicly get a hold of you, or are you just nah, I'm on social media, but I just kind of keep to myself. I mean, yeah. Like, if if I usually share all of my contact information at conferences and stuff, if people have you know have questions or you know, I also have like a list of resources and stuff that I've used and I recommend to other people. Um, if you're going through something or if you know somebody maybe who handled a call and just need a little bit of extra support. Um, so yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what the best way is to share that with people, but I'm definitely open for that. Feel free. What's the easiest? Are you on Instagram or on Facebook or? Um, Facebook's probably the easiest place to find me. I don't really check my Instagram. Um, and on Facebook, I'm just Amanda Whitney, and you'll see that I work at the Burke County Sheriff's Office. That'll so you'll, <laughs> you'll find it. Um, easy to find. Yeah, yeah. John, do you have any parting words? Wanted to give a shout out to Burke County Dispatcher Mandy, who's working tonight. She's brand new, but she's uh, in good hands to have a long career here with her supervisor Amanda, who was, you know, uh, obviously just born for the job, talented at it. Uh, thank you guys for doing what you're doing down there in Burke County. And uh, thank you for telling a story, not only of, of your own journey, but of the things that can happen in Nebraska, because a lot of people just don't know about the bad stuff that can go on out there. And uh, we really appreciate you being on the show. And the mere fact that we're, we're running towards two hours just shows how much Drew has really enjoyed this episode. And uh, to be honest, like I, I look up to both of you and I, I'm proud to be associated with you guys. Wow. Uh... I never knew that. I think I'm going to cry now. So uh, from on behalf of Amanda, uh, 
And John, who is at uh, at difficult to look at pictures, I'm Drew Breezy, Drew at Drew underscore B R E A S Y. I was made fun of earlier, like I'm an old man who doesn't know how to handle a VCR, but I do know my way around the internet. Apparently, uh, we're we're gonna wrap up for now. Uh, please call and leave us a voicemail. We didn't get to any calls today because uh, I know it might shock you, but I am an old man who doesn't know how to operate a VCR. So please call 848-266-6911, 848-266-COM. Uh, I'm sorry. 848-COM-911. That's pretty catchy, isn't it, Amanda? Um, I, I, I thought of that. Uh, not John. <laughs> but um, thank you very much, Amanda, for coming. Thank you all for listening. Don't forget that this drops as a podcast on Saturdays. I need you to tell your Aunt Sally to share, uh, I mean, to like and share this whole thing. Uh, we want to keep the flame going, and we want to get all the dispatchers involved in this thing. We want to get the cops involved so they can hear Amanda's story and and uh, hear the truth, to be honest, and, and the firefighters as well. So uh, until then, John, Amanda, don't go anywhere. We talked about this before. Uh, we'll see you soon. Good night.